Well, good uh, morning, good afternoon, whenever you're watching uh, this little video that we're putting together. Uh, we're calling these United We Stand, and as you know, we're talking about friends in ministry, our partners, those that have come to Sedgley over the years and ministered to us, my good friends who've been a real asset in my life. And um, I've got Moray with us today, Moray McGuffey, uh, many of you remember him. He's come on many of occasions, called out all sorts of sicknesses where words of knowledge and people's lives have been touched and transformed. Uh, it's been a privilege to know for a pretty good uh, 15 years now. And um, he's just going to share a little bit about his story. So, uh, good morning, Moray. How are we doing? Morning. Do you want to share your story more, are you? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Great to be online with you all this morning. Some I mean, of you have heard my testimony before when I visited the church. Um, I was born into a showbiz family. My father was very well known in the music industry. He was a famous jazz musician. Um, lots of music for top films and TV series and released lots of albums and LPs. Very popular in the media as it was then. And people didn't know what he was really like behind closed doors. He was a, a violent alcoholic. He used to beat my mother quite badly, put in hospital many times. He used to beat us as children. I used to get whipped with the Hoover cable on quite a regular basis. So I was only very small. So we all lived in fear of my father, but we still loved him, which is really unusual, but we know that from experience that that happens. Um, he left home when I had an affair with a few women. And my mother was became an alcoholic. And got into fits of drinking. One day she was drinking with a friend and cooking us chips on the cooker. The chip pan cooked for, cook fire. Um, she tried to put it out, tried to carry it out the door, but it was in the depths of the winter. She opened the back door. She was drunk at the time, the wind blew in, and she slipped up and she caught on fire. The legs were badly on fire. She was taken to hospital for about six weeks. And my father came home to look, look after us. During that time, he used to bring home his girlfriend, a woman called Rosemary. I was aged about four or five, and he used to make me sit on a lap and kiss her and tell her that I loved her. Of course, I hated it, it was very difficult, but my childhood was difficult. My mother came home, my parents split up. We decided to move to Devon. He promised to send us money, but the money never came through, so we struggled all the way through my childhood. Childhood it was very difficult. I was a warrior at school. My mother was still continuing with the, the drinking in, in times of great depression. We moved around from caravan, living in caravans, to bed sits, to all kinds of places. When I was 16, I started going to work in a supermarket um, as a training manager, working quite hard. I went to see a film called Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee, which I really enjoyed. I wanted to be like him, so I started to learn martial arts. I started to learn karate um, and did that for a number of years. I was the lowest grade in the club when I joined, but I was the first black belt other than the instructor. I did wonders for my confidence um, and I really kind of grew in my confidence and my pictures were in the papers. I was well known in the area for being a black belt. I got married at the age of 18. I didn't need to. I was kind of forced into marriage because of a difficult situation. But there are things went on. I moved into another job working in a cash and carry as an assistant manager. I used to have a foul mouth. I used to swear all the mm -hmm. time. And one of the people that used to give me a lift to work because I couldn't drive at the time was a born again Christian. Really nice guy. He used to, when he used to pick me up in his morning, his family used to be in the car and they were the clappy, happy Christians, the sort of people that really used to wind me up like a piano wire because I really dislike Christians very much. And the wife in particular used to wind me up because she used to say things like, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, and clap her hands at everything. And one day we were in a traffic jam in the centre of the town where I lived. And uh, we got stuck in a traffic jam, as I say. We pulled up to find a five power convertible with a sticker on the screen. screen. And it said, toot if you love Jesus. When I saw it, I thought, oh no, please don't let us see it. I think I prayed for the first time in my life. Please don't let us see it. But she saw it. And lifted up her hand to toot the horn to the car in front. 
I expected her to give a quick, a quick toot. What she in fact did was go ooh, 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 ooh. I was horrified so badly that I didn't go to work with them in the car anymore. I used to walk three out, three miles there and three miles back, so I, I just couldn't stand it. So work continued. I started to grow. I moved on, got promoted, went to move to the cash and carry in Weymouth. Did very well there, but the pressure was immense. They used to sack a manager about once a month in our area, so we were all under pressure. So I did well with the cash and carry, grew the turnover, grew the profitability, became a bit of a name in the organisation. The pressure was too much. I'd opened a couple of corrals in the area, so I started, decided to become a professional karate instructor. Opened a couple of a club in Weymouth and one in a place called Blanford. Opened a martial art about products that I was selling. Some of the other martial artists from different styles would get into conversations. And before, noon, before we knew it, we'd be fighting or sparring in the shop. So people used to walk past the shop. What on earth was going on? It was a really weird time. The clubs continued to grow. I was Japanese trained. My instructor was Japanese. I travelled all, all over the country to train with him. And then at the age of 27, I got very ill. I got measles, I was really ill, so I gave the shop somebody else to look after, and they destroyed the turnover. Got me into all kinds of financial problems, so I needed to get a job. So I closed down the store and looked for a job in a new newspaper. I saw an advert that said, financial consultants required, no experience is needed, full training will be provided, eight to 12,000 pounds a year. I needed Eight to twelve thousand pounds a year quite badly at the time, so I applied for the job, had three interviews, got the job, and before I knew it, I was doing really well. I, I found I had this ability to sell quite easily. I was top salesperson in the branch in my first four months, and then the regional top salesperson started to climb the ladder and promotion. And before I knew it, I was earning sort of footballers' wages. I was earning 10 grand a month at the time. This is about 1985, 1986. So £10,000 today is a lot of money, but then it was even more money. My boss was earning £140,000 a month and told me I could be like him. So I copied everything that he did, really. He's called Bob. And we used to have a phrase called, what would Bob do? And if we were ever confronted with a problem, we'd ask ourselves this question, what would Bob do? We'd probably heard of the phrase, what would Jesus do? This came out before that phrase came. So I worked. For a while the pressure was immense, but I still continued to grow my income. I had seven cars on my drive, massive houses. I became a bit of a nightmare. I was unfaithful to my wife. I did all kinds of things I shouldn't have done, but I didn't really care. The business continued to grow. I continued to expand. I run a large area of the country. I had really flash cars. I had my own Savile Road sailor. I used to buy anything I wanted. And then one day I didn't get paid. The money didn't come through because the company was growing so quickly it couldn't cope with the paperwork and people were leaving us because we were on a commission only basis. So my income started to suffer. I managed to continue, but my standing orders at that, at that time were 13,500 a month. I needed 13,500 a month just to pay my bills. I managed to survive for a few months and then I didn't get paid again. I didn't get paid for about three or four months. So I quickly got into debt. My bank manager called me, asked me to go and see him. I got him to increase my overdraft. But things still got difficult and got desperate. I left my, left my wife, moved to Swansea, bought, a, bought an apartment. But I was in a world of tur turmoil. Things got really, really difficult. Um, the company got so bad that I just couldn't take any more living with no money, so I decided to leave and become a went and joined another company for a guy that I've worked for in the past. And he made all kinds of promises, but didn't keep them. And I got into worse debt, into a worse situation, and started to contemplate suicide. I decided to start a business as a motivational speaker. Speaking on sales psychology, I still do that today, and communication, I travel around the country doing that. But I had a tidal world where tidal wave of, of debt behind me, a tsunami of debt. 
things got bad. I, I got married again to my wife. There's who some of you have met. She got pregnant. Oh, it was really difficult. I was constantly depressed, seriously contemplating ending, ending it all. I didn't know what to do. And I went into a shop to buy some paperwork for a course I was going to run. And I met two young men, two young brothers who got on really well with like a house on fire. I didn't know that they were Christians at the time. But we just got on and didn't notice that they didn't, they didn't swear. For some reason, I didn't notice my language, as I've said already, was really foul. Um, but we got on really well. Things got continued to, to get worse. And one evening, one of the brothers came around to my house. Now, I, if you know me, you'll know that I hate board games. I don't enjoy them at all. There's a knock at my door, and this guy, Phil, one of the brothers, was there with a board game under his arm. Pictionary, I'll never forget it. But he had a Chinese takeaway in a bag under his other arm and he was with his wife and said, we thought we'd call around and see you and play a game. Normally I would have said no, but I looked at the Chinese takeaway in his other hand and we'd been eating chips for about two weeks. So I said, come on in. So we played a game, which I didn't enjoy. And at the end we were talking and I started to own up the problems I was having about the situation I was in. He said, well, there's one easy answer to this. All you need to do is pray to God and he'll, he'll sort the situation out for you. And I basically said, I don't believe in God. I think it's a load of nonsense. I think it's a myth and legend, all that kind of stuff. But we had a chat and he said, seriously, if you pray to God and ask him to sort it out, he will. They left. I spoke to Des at the time, my wife. She was a Catholic. And she said, yeah, I'm sure it's true. I believe in God. And I thought, great. Another idiot. Des went to bed. I was in my kitchen with Almost in this big house that we were living in. God, if you're real, give me another £20,000 a month job and I'll believe in you. Of course, he didn't give me another £20,000 a month job. Things continued to get more difficult, but I still prayed that prayer every day. But the prayer over the few days and few coming weeks started to change from give me another £20,000 a month job. Lord, will you help me? God, will you help me? Will you prove to me you're real? Things got diff more difficult. People were knocking at the door for money. I got served writs, all kinds of things for money that I owed to car companies because I had all these cars on finance. We went on the run and stayed with Des's parents for sleeping on the floor for six weeks. Things got really difficult. I started to write a book called Goals, Reasons to Get Into Action. I thought I knew writing a book would be the answer. Desperate men really do do desperate things. But I couldn't really write it because I was so depressed. But one day I had a phone call from somebody that I'd done some training for, a company called Allied Dunbar, and he said, Murray, I was speaking to a customer of mine yesterday, a client of mine, who's a multimillionaire. He's looking for somebody to run his company, the sales side of his company. He lives in the Midlands. This is his number. Give him a call. So I signed myself up, gave him a phone call, rang him up, put my best, most powerful motivational voice, said all the right things. And he said, Murray, you sound just the sort of person that we're looking for. Can you be at my house in the Midlands tomorrow? Gave me the address. It was obviously some big, big house that he lived in. I said, yes, I'll be there, no problem. I put the phone down. I had no money, no car. My wife's parents had no money and no car as well. They did have a Triumph Herald that was held together by rust, but that wouldn't have got me out of the town, let alone to Birmingham. When I put the phone down, the phone rang immediately. You probably know some of the older people that are listening to this video, know that when you used to hang up the phone sometimes, it would immediately ring, start a ringtone and ring you back because you hadn't hung the phone up properly in the cradle. This time I put the phone down, it rang immediately. I went to pick it up and I answered it just as a matter of normality, expecting to hear a dial, dial, dial tone, but it was Phil, one of the brothers. I said, hi, what can I do for you? So we were just talking, me and my brother. We've just sacked our salesman. We've got a car here. Just wondered whether you need a car for anything. I was completely dumbfounded. I didn't say, yes, can I borrow your car to go to an interview? I just said, can I come to church on Sunday? Which they were really shocked about it because they been witnessing to me for weeks and weeks and weeks and getting nowhere and the guy Phil tried to put me off from coming to the church in the morning and he said it's a lot more traditional one at come in the evening I went to pick up that car Thursday night on the Thursday night 
with my brother-in-law who drove me down there. It was about nine o'clock at night. In the dark, I was driving home. I drove past the road where my house was. And I knew there was a pile, pile of debts outside or inside the door. And I just felt a wave of despair come over my life. And I, I, it's, I can still see it now. I looked up to the ceiling of my car and it was as if I could see the roof of the sea through the roof of the car. I could see the stars almost. And I screamed at, my, at the top of my voice in anger at God really and shook my fist at him. But this is what I said, well, this is what I shouted. I said, God, if you're real and you prove to me that you're real, I promise to follow you every day for the rest of my life. Nothing happened. I drove home. Went to church on Sunday, got into the meeting. It was really weird. There were people clapping to the music, people dancing to the music, people singing in between the songs in, in a language I couldn't understand. And I looked around the room. I didn't sing any of the songs. I just looked around the room and thought, I'm with a bunch of nuts. And I remember that time when I was in the car and that woman went, ooh, 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 on the horn. I thought, I'm with another, a load of nutters here. They, they went through the worship. A guy preached the message, which I can't remember anything about it. I can't remember. I just know the, the guy that did it. We went home and had lunch with my friends. They asked me what I thought of it. I said I thought it was really weird. It didn't make any sense. And then the guy rang from the church because he knew that we were trying to sell some things to raise the deposit to rent a house. I got into a conversation. He knew I was selling a, a video camera for about three hundred pounds which is a lot of money for, it wasn't really worth that. But anyway, he said, I'll have the camera off you. I said, brilliant, when do you want to organise that? I said, well, can you come next Sunday to church and I'll give you the money then? And I remember thinking, good ploy to get me there to church again. But I said, yes, I hung the phone up. My wife did ask what I was talking about. I said, the guy wants to buy our camera. He wants us to go back to church tonight. For some reason, I lied to my wife to go back to church that evening. Went back to church that evening, got into the church, worship started, and they started to sing a song called Lord I Lift Your Name on Your Name on High. Many of you will know it. After a minute or two, I realized I was singing the song. And I realized I was singing the song at the top of my voice. And I realized I was singing in, in harmony because I'm a musician. And then something else I noticed was I realized I believed what I was singing. I believe that Jesus did die for me, he did rise again. And I remember looking around the room and looking at all the people singing and worshiping and thinking it's real, if this is true. I went home from the meeting, didn't say anything to my wife, but I had a, a smile on my face, I suppose, but it didn't, it didn't make sense because I was still under stress and still with loads of worry. Phil rang me the next morning to see what I thought about the next day. My wife was sat next to me as we spoke and I said, yes, Phil, I've decided to make Jesus Lord of my life. He burst into tears. My Des, Des looked at me like I was an, an alien. She was shocked and disappointed. You could see the look in her face. Thought, thought I'd done something crazy because of all the pressure I was under. Mm. So, no coincidence, the money we needed for that deposit, which was £750, came in in three days, exactly to the, to the pound. Funny how things work out, isn't it? It's not a coincidence. God was involved. We decided to drive down to the house, to the house to get some items to arrange to move into the new house. When I lived in the house, I lived next door to a doctor, a GP who I got on really well with. Just to have a good laugh. We just go out for drinks and things like that with him. He was just a great guy. When he saw me pulled up outside in the car, he came out and he went over to us and said, Murray, we've been worrying about you. Worrying about Des because Des was heavily pregnant. We haven't seen you for six weeks. What's been going on? He said, Come in for a cup of coffee. And I wanted to say no. I didn't want to talk about it. But Des was walking into the house. So I followed him. And when I walked into the house, they were stood in the kitchen and at the back of the kitchen. And I remember when I was walking through the, the hallway, they had a big kitchen like we did. And the guy was called Gareth. And he said, Murray, what's been going on? We've been worried about you. And I wanted to say, had a few problems. I've been under stress, but this is the words that came out of my mouth. I had every intention of saying that, but the words that came out of my mouth were, I found Jesus and I burst into tears. They looked absolutely horrified and so did my wife. They stared at me for a couple of seconds and then looked at Des to see, is this to say, have you? And Des said, I haven't. I'm normal. 
my life changed dramatically after that point. I still had loads of situations to deal with, loads of worries, loads of problems, loads of debts to pay off. But I suddenly had somebody in my life that could change these things and enable me to face the problems and go through them. You know, I could give loads and loads of examples about how he intervened in the most difficult situations, in the most stressful of situations. But, you know, if you ask Jesus to come into your life, he will, and he'll change your life. Mm -hmm. Steve, is it all right if I say a prayer for people? Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, do, do so I don't know everyone in there. Say again, Steve, sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, go on, please, yeah, do. Yeah. Okay. I don't know everyone out there. I know that many of you go to Steve's church and you have a strong belief and a strong faith in Jesus, and that's wonderful. But I know there are probably some people listening or watching this video that have never made a decision to accept Christ into their life, never acknowledged him for who he is. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. When you acknowledge Jesus for who he is, when you ask him for forgiveness, because we all need forgiveness for all the things that we've done wrong, when you do that, he will come into your life in a powerful way and he'll change your life in a radical way. The problems don't disappear like they did in my life, but you have somebody who's going to go through them with, them, with you and who's going to be faithful, never leave you, never desert you, and you'll find you have a strength that you never knew about. I have people, I remember when I came to Steve's church many years ago, the first time there was a lady that wasn't sleeping and uh, prayed for her and she, she had insomnia and she slept like a baby the next night and I think I've been back in a couple of times and she told me she's still sleeping. God is God, God, God is good. If you let him get involved in your life, he'll change it in a dramatic way. So I'm gonna say a simple prayer. All I need to do is to repeat the prayer after me and if you say it with intention, if you say it and you really mean it, God will get involved in your life and your life will change dramatically. So this is the prayer, repeat it. You can say it out loud if you want. You can whisper it. You can say it in your head, but as long as you mean it, God will hear it and your life will change. So this is the prayer. Lord Jesus, I've heard Murray's story. I've heard how you, you you intervened in the most complicated and difficult situation. I know that you know about my name, my life, and you even know my address. You know every worry and concern, everything I've ever done, everything that's been not as it should be, where I've done things that are wrong, where I've lied and cheated, perhaps. Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to cleanse me. I ask you to make me clean. I acknowledge you for who you are today. You, I make you my Lord and my Saviour, and I ask you to be my guide and my very best friend. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you said that prayer, Steve's going to tell you how you can get in contact with his church and let him know you said that prayer. We'd love to hear from you. So I'll leave that over to Steve in a minute. I just feel that we need to pray for people who are not well. Over the years, I've seen people healed miraculously of all kinds of things, and many times it's been instant. Not because I've been praying for them, because I've used one name, the name of Jesus. So when we lift up him, it's the name above everything. His name is the most powerful name in the whole world. The most powerful name above the earth, on the earth, and below the earth. So I'm going to pray for those people who are sick. Well, Jesus, I pray for those people out there now, Father God, within the sound of my voice who are not well. Father God, you know their conditions. Father God, I speak to cancer in the name of Jesus. I command it to reverse in the name of Jesus. I speak to depression in the name of Jesus. I command it to re reverse. I speak to every condition out there. Father God, you can do it. So, Father God, we ask you to send your word. We ask you to heal. In Jesus' name, your word says that you bore all our sicknesses and diseases. Father God, if you bore them, that means we don't have to bear them. Father God, your word says that by his stripes you are healed. By his stripes you were healed. So, Father God, we appropriate those words for every person listening right now. And we command sicknesses to reverse, conditions to disappear, healing to come. In Jesus' name. God bless you. It's been a real pleasure to speak for you, Steve. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you, Moray, from coming in from uh, Neath in Wales, right there in the valleys. I've had the privilege of preaching at uh, Moray's church uh, several times. So God bless everyone there. 
and all that you're doing in this time of lockdown. We're locked down, but we're not locked out. God's on the move. And um, so thank you, Moray. Just to let you know, guys, Moray um, is, is really teaching from a heart of uh, knowing what God's done and continues to do. He's suffering himself, um, but God's working through amazingly. Sometimes God doesn't take us out, but he takes us through. And uh, he's a testimony of great grace on, on their lives. So would you give you our look to the kids and to Des, and uh, we'll speak to you soon, mate. God bless you. Bless you, Steve. God, God bless.